So, so y you are not only saying that uh, r religious people are coming to a wrong conclusion, you are saying they're, a they're asking a silly question. Yes. Um, there is a, uh, a scientist in the United States named Michael Behe, I'm sure you've, you're involved in this uh, argument, who, who is making the case, he is not a creationist, he is not a creation scientist. Or oh, I'm sorry, he, says, he is a creationist. Well, he, he says he's he not. Says he's not he, he says he he's is. not. Yeah. But, but, but uh, his, his theory is that of a hidden designer, that there is uh, something driving this process. And could you explain how yes. you and he differ on this? Um, like right. I said, he's a creationist, a hidden designer. That's, that's, a hidden, that's you say that's he's a, a hidden creationist. Well, he's not, not even hidden. He's a, he's a straightforward creationist. Uh, what he has done is to take a standard argument, which is date, dates back to the 19th century, the argument of irreducible complexity, the argument that uh, there are certain organs, certain systems, in which all the bits have to be there together or the whole system won't work. Like the, the whole eye. Thing, like the eye. Right. The whole thing collapses if they're not all there. Now Darwin considered that argument for the eye and he dismissed it correctly by showing that actually the eye could have evolved by gradual stages. Bits of an eye, half an eye is better than no eye, a quarter of an eye is better than no eye, half an eye is better than a quarter of an eye. I mean, if it has some sight, but if you just created the windshield wiper, it doesn't... It, exactly. So, so, I mean, there are things which you could imagine which are irreducibly complex, but the eye is not one of them. Hmm. Now, Behe is saying, well, maybe the eye isn't one of them, but at the molecular level, there are certain things which he says are. Now, he takes certain molecular examples. For example, bacteria have a flagellum, which is a little kind of whip-like tail by right, which they yes. swim. And the flagellum is a remarkable thing because uniquely in all the living kingdoms, it's a true wheel. It actually rotates freely in a bearing. It has an axle which, which freely rotates. That's a remarkable thing, and it's well understood and well, well known about. And Behe asserts this is irreducibly complex, Therefore, God made it. Now, but therefore, there was a design to it. I, I don't what's think the difference? Okay. Therefore, there was a, <laughs> well, we'll therefore there was a, we'll a design to it. it. Right. Now, when people said the eye is too complex, the eye is irreducibly complex. Therefore, God made it. Darwin answered them point by point, piece by piece. But maybe he shouldn't have bothered. Maybe what he should have said is, well, maybe you can't think of. Maybe you're too thick to think of a reason why the eye could have come about by gradual steps. But perhaps you should go away and think a bit harder. Now, I've done it for the eye, I've done it for various other things. I haven't yet done it for the bacterial flagellum. I've only just read Behe's book. It's an interesting point, I'd like to think about it. But I'm not the best person equipped to think about it because I'm not a biochemist. You've got to have the equivalent biochemical knowledge to the knowledge that Darwin had about lenses and, and bits, of, bits of eyes. Now, I don't have that biochemical knowledge. Behe has. Behe should stop being lazy and should get up and think for himself about how the flagellum evolved. Instead of this cowardly, lazy copping out, by simply saying, oh, well, I can't think of how it came about, therefore it must have been designed. I can understand, I can understand your reaction against fundamentalism because it excludes other non-religious forms of thought, especially in schools, but, but your own Anglican education didn't, didn't, didn't seem intolerable to you, yet you seem as though you still want to bring your attack to bear upon those who are given a religious education, even though it might have, might have the liberality manifested by your own religious education. No, I think that... Um, for, for one thing, I could come back to the point that the fact that many of us do manage to escape from this is no, is no argument, because many, many don't. And so uh, that's, that's the first point. Um, I think that the next point is that so much of religious education actually is rather more pernicious than I or I think you ever had. Um, it only takes a minority to take it really seriously when they grow up. And uh, it can be extremely dangerous. Uh, obviously, the vast majority of Muslims in this country, and indeed in the world, are nice, peace-loving people. 
but their holy book and their um, whole religious teaching teaches them things like apostates should die, infidels should die, if you die a martyr you go to a special corner of heaven. But you and know that most of them don't believe that. I though. know that most of them don't, yeah. don't believe that, but, but that's no defense because it doesn't take most of them in order for horrible things, suicide bombings and things, to happen. You, do, you only need a minority to say, I really believe this stuff. What you're saying is, oh, we needn't worry because most people don't take their religion seriously. Well, I'm glad they don't take their religion seriously, but it only takes a minority to take their religion seriously. And the majority who go along with religious education and, and people like you, if I may say so, who say, well, there's no harm in it because most people don't believe it. You are making the world safe for the minority who really do believe what they're told. Well, the argue, and because when you attack moderates, then you say that really moderates do create the circumstances under which fundamentalism can exist. Is that a, is that a that's reasonable right, paraphrase? Yes, that's right, yes. that's right. But don't you risk, by doing that, alienating the moderates? Because you could have moderates on your side against fundamentalists. But if, in fact, you are attacking the moderates for opening the door to fundamentalism, yeah. you lose them. Yeah. It's a very difficult pr problem, and I'm constantly trying to balance this. It's a, it's a very difficult difficult juggling act. Do you try to get the moderates on your side and or do, or do you try to say you're making the world safe for the fundamentalists? Um, and I, I, from day to day I, I vary. I wish the moderates would come out a bit more. I mean I would love to hear moderates, moderate Muslims for example, who instead of carefully and quietly getting on with their lives in an inoff inoffensive way, which of course most of them do, why don't they stand up and condemn the fundamentalists and the reason I, what one possible reason is that in order to do so they would have to disavow aspects of their own faith I mean they are taught the Quran is the literal word of God so in a way the fundamentalists are the true ones who are really following the faith they're the ones who actually take it seriously so what we're asking the moderates to do is to say I don't take my faith seriously, and nor should you. It's a difficult thing but to But you ask say that you say. wobble on this, that yes. you are uncertain, that you go from day to day. I mean, you, you quite enjoy spending time with, well, I'm thinking of a moderate like the Bishop of Oxford, for example, with whom you get on really rather well. well. Uh, I mean, here's a, here's a moderate Anglican you get on well with. You don't yes, really, uh, and, you don't suggest that he opens the way for fundamentalist no, evangelical I mean, Christianity. He's a delightful man, and so is the Archbishop of Canterbury, and and so is every bishop I think I've, I've ever ever, ever met. And um, in this particular case, when when I mean I, I've collaborated with the ex bishop of Oxford, Richard Harris, I think on a couple of occasions, um, over the, this infamous school in the north of England at Gateshead, um, which teaches fundamentalist Christianity, you know, the world is only 6,000 years old and things like that. He and other bishops are as outraged by that as I am. And now and there is an absolutely textbook case where cooperation with moderate Christians entirely makes sense. And, and, that's, and that's what I do, so yes. You have written that being uh, an atheist allows you to become intellectually fulfilled. No, I haven't quite written that. What I've written okay. is that before Darwin, it was difficult to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist, and that Darwin made it easy to become an intellectual... F I mean, it's more... It's more if, you, if, you, if you want to be an atheist, it would have been hard to be an atheist before Darwin came along. But once Darwin came along, the argument from design, which has always been to me the only powerful argument, it, even that isn't a very powerful argument, but I used to think it was, the only powerful argument for the existence of a creator, Darwin destroyed the argument from design, at least as far as biology is concerned, which has always been the happiest hunting ground for argument from design. Uh, thereafter, w whereas before Darwin came along, you could have been an atheist, but you'd have been a bit worried. After Darwin, you can be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. You can feel, really, now I understand how living things have acquired the illusion of design. I understand why they look as though they've been designed. Whereas before Darwin came along, you would have said, well, I can see that the theory of a divine creator isn't, isn't a good theory, but I'm damned if I can think of a better one. After Darwin, you can think of a better one. I mean, isn't the standard 
rebuttal to that that God created Darwin and he could have created this whole evolutionary illusion that you were uh, talking about and, and well, I mean getting back to, to first causes yes. that you sort of yeah no, not that God created Darwin away. but you mean God, God created the, 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 the conditions in which evolution happened yeah, and Darwin well ultimately Darwin I mean, ultimately. Uh, yes it's a uh, it's, it's, it's not a very satisfying explanation. It's a very unparsimonious, very uneconomical explanation. Uh, the, the beauty of the Darwinian explanation itself is that it's exceedingly powerful. It's a very simple principle, and using this one simple principle, you can bootstrap your way up from essentially nothing Oh. to the world of complexity and diversity we have today. Now that's a powerful explanation. It, it, it's not any simpler, in fact, it's more complex than the uh, than Genesis. I mean, and God created the heavens and the earth. You have that, to that, be that, joking. Uh, well, I mean, God created the heavens and the earth. I can say that pretty quickly. You can I mean, say it, but yeah. think what lies behind it. What lies behind it is a complicated, intelligent being, God, who must have come from somewhere. You have simply smuggled in at the beginning of your book the very thing that we're trying to explain. What we're trying to explain is where organized complexity and intelligence came from. We have now got an explanation. But, you but start I'm from nothing and you work up gradually in easily ex explainable steps. But then I can ask you the same question, where does the nothing come from? I mean, I, this is a, I, mean, this, I, I don't want this to degenerate no. into a, a sophomore beer, beer brawl, but I mean, you know, that, that yeah. is, isn't that the ultimate? You can ask that. That's the ultimate question. Right, it's right. an important question. But all I would say to that is that it's a hell of a lot easier to say where nothing came from than it is to say where 30 million species of highly complicated organisms plus a super intelligent god came from. And that's the alternative. Well, now, 